by now you might have seen a few of my posts and you might have seen what's the overall big picture that I am presenting and you might have and you must have seen um, the key messages and ideas uh, that I'm trying to deliver with my videos here. Um, I'm working as um, a photonics scientist at Seagate Technology UK. It's an American uh, multinational firm uh, that specializes in hard drive and data storage technologies. Most probably if you open up your um, your computers, um, if you see the hard drives, they will most probably be from Seagate. <clears throat> so that was just a quick intro. I did my PhD back in 2018 and uh, I was working as a Marie Curie um, early stage researcher at the University of Sheffield. Um, I've seen several posts on this group um, and even on my posts people have been asking if I could provide any help um, regarding the, the Marie Curie uh, fellowship process. For today's video um, I've thought about five uh, points for a Marie Curie early stage researcher individual fellowship or individual training networks uh, fellowship process and I think it's good really to know um, the facts and figures from someone who's already done it. Now um, while you are working as a Marie Curie fellow um, that's also a very great um, experience uh, to see the things for yourself but I believe you see the bigger picture only if you are out of that process and then when you look back um, you look you look at some stats some data figures um, then you probably have a, a much clearer idea than someone who is currently um, a fellow at this point during my Marie Curie fellowship program and after uh, the fellowship program um, I've been into several meetings um, I've seen some uh, important data and statistics from uh, the European Union on the employment of the the fellows and overall so I think I have um, maybe a better idea at this point than I had when I was a fellow that's why I thought it would be best if I share my experience uh, directly with you um, and probably we can maybe do another video at a later point depending on whether the admins think it's appropriate if if there are still a number of questions so the first thing is what is a Marie Curie Fellowship? Um, most of you already know by now uh, that it is uh, no doubt um, the world's highest paid uh, PhD program. Uh, it's sponsored by the European Union. You will you'll be working as um, a Marie Curie Early Stage Fellow in one of the, the partner or one of the member European uh, Union countries. It's very tightly timed as I've said in some as I've said in some of my posts, um, it's tightly timed at three years. That's it. It's only three years, no more than that. So um, the funding is released directly from the European Union. Uh, it's paid out in euros. Um, and the salary that all the Marie Curie fellows get is not the same. So this is something very important that you must consider. I will give you uh, one example uh, directly from our consortium when when I was a PhD student back in 2015 we had a, a big consortium of um, 18 students and some of um, and, and we were all spread across the UK uh, sorry we were all spread across the, the European Union um, I along with three others uh, was working in the UK while we have other colleagues in um, in Germany um, uh, in Spain, um, uh, in France, in Italy, um, uh, and a few other countries, including Ireland as well. The first thing is you, the salary, although from the European Union it's, it's a fixed amount, but that fixed amount doesn't go into your pocket. Of course there will be taxes, but then what you get at the end of the day also depends on which country you are. Uh, if you are, for example, uh, working in Spain as a Marie Curie researcher, your salary will be less than um, than a same Marie Curie fellow working in Italy or in the UK, for example. Um, one specific case is the UK, which is probably one of the most expensive countries uh, in the UK, according to Marie Curie figures. So um, Marie Curie fellows in the UK get high, one of the high salaries. The second thing is you get 
um, a, a marriage allowance, a fixed amount of five or six hundred euros. I don't remember the amount now, but this is fixed and it depends on whether you are married at the start of your Marie Curie contract. So say if you are not married uh, at the start of your contract and then you get married later on, you will, you will never get that allowance. So this is also an important thing to bear in mind. And what are the academic requirements? I have seen in this group and maybe in other places as well, I think to some degree there are um, lots of myths about Marie Curie program. Yes, no doubt it's the highest paid program in the world, but it's not strictly academic. Okay. Um, I personally know uh, people um, who, who have finished their Marie Curie um, fellowships and their either their percentages in the bachelor's degree they were less than 75 percent or their CGPAs um, was less than three so that's for sure okay there, there is no uh, beating around the bush here I'm just telling you the straightforward information uh, based on my own experience during Marie Curie fellowships so there is no hard and fast requirement of a three CGPA if your CGPA is less than three you can still qualify for Marie Curie fellowship um, the next important point is what is the selection process of Marie Curie Fellows? Um, over here, um, I would also uh, like to briefly mention about the language tests. Um, as, as you all are aware, um, that most of this, uh, most of um, international universities would require either TOEFL or IELTS. In some countries, it's a necessary. Um, you know, like a strict requirement for example in the UK you have to have an IELTS to get entry into the UK so anyways it's always a good idea to have your language test handy and results with you okay um, try to clear the language tests um, with, with, the, with, with the necessary uh, grade requirement uh, I believe it's something very useful you should have uh, but again um, I know people who have done Marie Curie fellowship without an, a language test. Yes, that's for sure. And I know people who have done it. Uh, and the reason, um, the reason for this is it's ultimately down to the selection committee, the selection um, university of your Marie Curie program. If English language is in their requirement, you have to do it. If they, are, if they don't require this, and if just um, a certificate of language proficiency from your uh, from university would do then that's okay like you don't need to have a, a language test but at the end of the day you don't want the language test to be a showstopper for you right you would never want that so it's always a good idea to just take your language test and pass it uh, with, with good grades now let's come and talk about um, the selection process of Marie Curie fellows Remember, it's down to the selection committee. By selection committee, I mean the professors in that particular university uh, say who will be interviewing you, and then it depends on the requirement of your host university. So, um, it's completely up to them. The selection process is normally uh, a face-to-face, -face or in this case, like a Skype or a Teams or a video interview. Uh, this is by far the most common practice. Um, remember, um, the selection process, it completely depends on uh, the people who are interviewing you and the academic requirements depend um, on the university that will be hosting you. I would give you an example from my own experience. Um, my host university was um, the University of Sheffield in England. And I was interviewed for the Marie Curie Fellowship um, in the start of 2015. Um, at that time, I was working in Switzerland um, as scientific collaborator. So I remember my interview was uh, arranged on Skype. Um, I, I had to go to um, I had to go through um, two interviews. The first one was on Skype. Um, it was with the uh, with my supervisor and co-supervisor. Um, at first it was just a general introduction of myself um, they asked me what I was working on uh, what was the project that I was working on you know just an overall picture just an, not not in-depth technical things um, then they asked a few questions about my project that I was working on I just had to briefly explain it um, and then they 
explained the position that I was being interviewed for. And they also asked me uh, if I had any relevant coursework. Um, of course, I did. Of course, I had relevant coursework related to the project that I was applying for at the Marie Curie Fellowship. Um, there was one stage before this Skype interview, and that was uh, they sent me a questionnaire. It was four questions. Um, it was um, the technical, um, the questions were about the project that I was supposed to work as um, on, a, on, a, on my Marie Curie Fellowship. So uh, you, you see now, it was a pretty, like I would say, a convenient process. Uh, they said uh, they sent me a questionnaire, and I had to. Um, I was allowed to look for, uh, you know, answers and uh, send the questionnaire back to them and explain uh, in detail answers to um, the five questions uh, that they had asked me um, in that questionnaire. So, the point of this is just to give you an idea of how variable the selection process of Marie Curie is. Remember, there is no strict, hard, and fast guideline. Okay. I remember I was not asked to provide my um, my letter of motivation, for example, um, f for the Marie Curie Fellowship. Now I'm not sure if by this time the the, the European Union do require a, a letter of motivation. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure about this. Uh, but uh, the the selection as a Marie Curie Fellow heavily depends on the host university and and their own requirements. Uh, the final. Um, and the most important thing here is that what you should know is you will know the project that you are applying to um, if you want to be selected as a Marie Curie fellow, right? Remember to know, remember to have some know-how. A technical know-how at this point is very important because it's not only your academic credentials, it's not only your high uh, GPA in your bachelor's or your uh, or, or, or the number of papers that you have. Remember they want to assess your suitability to the role and the first thing that they would want to know is do you know anything about the project that you are applying to? That is very very important. So like if I give my example again, I was in during my interview I was asked some technical questions related to the project that I was applying for. Um, and to be honest, I, I, if I remember correctly, um, I could answer only like 60% of the questions uh, correctly. If you don't answer, if you, if you don't know something during the interview, it's better to say straightforward, sorry, I don't know. Don't try to beat around the bush. Don't try to explain it. Don't try to convince them that you know, if you don't know, okay? It's better to say, I don't know, sorry. The other important thing is, um, if you have some research publications, um, I think they will help you, um, uh, even if they are not directly relevant to the project that you are applying to. So, if you have any research output, make sure um, to, to highlight it in your CV, in your resume, uh, during your interview. Uh, so, these are the few important guidelines. Uh, what I've heard now is due to the COVID pandemic, and everything um, they're asking people to provide uh, maybe a three minutes introduction a video um, resume remember in this three minute introduction uh, you would have to uh, provide your relevant achievements for the position that you are applying to remember they are not interested in where were you born they are not interested in uh, which school or college you went to and they are not interested in what was your CGPA right um, just try to be concise uh, and precise and just try to be to the point, stick to the point and if you have any achievements that are relevant to the role, remember, do not forget to highlight them. Uh, they will give you an advantage. So, uh, I hope I've been able to uh, put forward uh, the important points uh, regarding Marie Curie process. Um, just a quick recap, I will summarize them again. The first one is um, try to visit ec.europa.eu or your access portals. Uh, these scholarships are around. Uh, these scholarships are announced all year around. You know, uh, they, they they don't have any specific time window. They are active throughout the year. The next thing is um, your language test. Um, it's important to have a language test. Although some universities may allow you admission even without a language test, but that's completely up to the host university but you don't want that thing to stop the entire process for you so it's better to have a language test um, ready.
Remember, uh, you should demonstrate some degree of technical uh, knowledge, although it will not be like they won't expect you to give them 100% correct answers, uh, but they would still want to assess your technical background. So um, whatever the project is that you are applying to, uh, make sure that you know something about that, that you have some relevant coursework or research work um, related to that project. Um, and again, it's not strictly academic scholarship. Uh, if you have a CGPA less than three, you could still uh, win the scholarship. You would just have to play it very smart. Make sure to go through the application process, the procedure, which will be clearly laid out um, on the Europa.eu or the Euraccess portal that you are applying through uh, for the Marie Curie Fellowship. So I hope uh, I've been able to, um, to lay important points in front of you. Uh, but if there are still um, any questions about that, uh, maybe you can let me know in the comments um, and maybe I can try to come back with another video message. Um, of course, if the group admins think it would be suitable. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks very much. Um, if, if anyone's applying for the Marie Curie Fellowship, I would, um, I would, I would wish them the very best of uh, their luck and the uh, very best of their successes. So thank you very much and take care and all the best for Marie Curie Fellowship. Bye-bye.